whenever you're ready to go. Okay, great. All right. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm so excited about this presentation tonight. I just want to start with a couple of housekeeping items. If you could please make sure your um, microphone is on mute, that would be wonderful. Um, and also, if you could go to um, the upper icon for view and please click, please select speaker view. This will allow you to see Anita and her presentation. We're gonna share photos, but you'll see Anita and you'll see the photos. Um, I'm gonna just kind of read my intro, but so excuse me if my eyes pop over to my paper really quickly. Um, my name is Tanya Russo Hamilton and I'm on the board of directors at Italian Portland. We are a nonprofit Italian cultural organization based out of Portland, Oregon. Um, our mission is to raise awareness of Italian culture and its influence in the world through um, cultural events, education, as well as service. Um, you are in for a real treat this evening as our speaker is very engaging and an expert in the area of Neapolitan cuisine. She is joining us all the way from New Jersey. So thank you, Anita, for, for having a different time zone and joining us. My pleasure. Anita San Severino is an award-winning photographer dedicated to the subject of Italy, as well as a lecturer and scholar of Italian history and culture. More than 25 years ago, San Severino began by photographing New York City from the charming streets of Greenwich Village to the soaring Twin Towers and iconic Brooklyn Bridge. Every San Severino photograph is suffused with her love of the subject and sense of mission to reveal something previously unseen. With a passionate eye and studied knowledge of Italy, San Severino's <coughs> photographs uniquely capture the beauty <coughs> and character of the country's landscape, cities, villages, and cultural traditions. From the religious devotion of patron saint festivals, the Presepio Napolitano, and the celebrated Car Carnivale of Venice, to the haunting gnarled olive groves of the Puglia region. Anita is a recipient of the Women of Achievement in the Arts Award in New Jersey and has exhibited her photographs at the 20 2009 Tusha Arts Festival in Viterbo, Italy, the Columbus Citizens Foundation, and Queens College in New York. I could go on and on, but I will stop here so that we can get this event started. With that, I would like to turn it over to Anita San Severino. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Benvenuti. I'm happy that you're all here. Um, I appreciate it. So uh, let's get started. Um, the first thing I want to say um, about this lecture and about the subject matter is that although food is revered all over Italy, it is practically a religion in Naples. Uh, I've never, you know, I've been all, all over Italy for many, many years uh, in people's homes and, and you know, the natives and um, it's just then no no one pays attention um, to the rituals and the details of food the way Neapolitans do um, and you know eating is this sacred ritual and every part of it is infused with that attention to detail and an appreciation of every part of it from the buying to the preparing, to the serving, and to the eating. So it's it's all very, very important. Um, and one thing I've learned over the many years is that what tastes good to a normal person doesn't taste that good to a Neapolitan. I have been in restaurants uh, with friends, and I, I thought everything was delicious. And then when we would leave, they'd say, oh, no, no, never again. Terrible, terrible food no good. And I'd be like, I was fine. <laughs> I thought it was very good, but um, no, it didn't rise to their standards, especially the food uh, in the restaurants along the sea, which is where I like to go. One of my favorite places because you have a view of that beautiful water and the Vesuvio, but if it's not up to standard, they'd rather go to a nondescript little trattoria tucked away somewhere where they know they're going to get the best uh, food. And, uh, you know, even the herbs, even whatever goes into the dish, they know if it was a fresh herb used or not. We bought, um, um, what was it, the, um, one of the spices, I guess it was oregano. And 
I bought it and I thought it was fine, but they said it wasn't fresh enough. Uh, so this attention to detail is really important. Um, and this freshness is so important that for most Neapolitans, they still go to the market every day uh, for their fresh foods. So here is an example. This is the largest uh, market in the center of Naples. It's called Pina Seca. And as you can see, you know, they, they have everything from dried foods to fresh fruit and vegetables to fish. You'll see a lot of the fish. Um, this is actually what they call a tavola calda. And what it is, is, you know, different, not necessarily just sandwiches, but other kinds of food um, that have meat in them, uh, even, even some fish, and they serve it right there and you stand at the counter and you can eat it. Uh, so that's in every marketplace and on street corners too. And there are your varieties of pasta and, you know, all the styles. Now this is a triparilla. Uh, could you go back to that other one? The one where they show the tree, the tribe? Yeah. Shouldn't it be right next to this one? Did it disappear, Tanya? There it is. When I saw that, I was like, no, I guess I'm really not a, a true Neapolitan because I could not eat that. That is tripe. So, and then the variety of fish is like nothing I've seen anywhere else in Italy. It's just amazing. Um, and we're not even talking that much about fish tonight, but this is, this is what you'll see in the market. The octopus, and of course the, the little baby clams. That's, I don't know what, I guess that's an eel. I'm not sure. That's the lady selling spices. And now we have a little story about, again, this attention to detail. I have to tell you about this incident that happened when I first um, was doing this presentation. The group sent out a photo that I had not sent. I had not sent a particular photo of the pizza. So they took one off the internet um, and advertised my lecture with the piece with the picture of pizza. And it was not this picture. So I get a text. I, I sent I sent the presentation, the publicity brochure uh, on by email to a friend of mine in Naples. And he wrote back and said, I'm glad that you're, you know, doing this lecture and you're talking about the food of maples, but you must get rid of that picture immediately. You have to tell them to take that picture away um, because it is not true Neapolitan pizza because you can tell, or he said he could tell, that it was not cooked in a forno a legno, a wood-fired oven. It was done in an electric oven, and that could not be true Neapolitan pizza. And how did he know it wasn't uh, baked in a true forno a legno? Because as you can see, you see this burnt crust, the edging all around here and how puffy it is. Well, in the picture, you could see it wasn't very puffy. It wasn't, didn't have those little burn marks around the edges. Um, and he could tell that that means that it was not baked in a forno a legno that it was from an electric oven. And he knew immediately, he said it looked more like a biscotti than, um, than a pizza crust. So the crust is very, very important as well as the rest of the pizza. Um, however, since then, I read an article that stated that the, uh, it's called the Vera Verace Pizza Napolitano organization is now allowing electric ovens to be used and it still can be called the true Neapolitan pizza. So that is a departure. But when I mentioned that to my friends in Naples, they said, no way, it's not gonna happen. So we'll see. You know, pr what they call progress doesn't always necessarily mean it's a good thing. Um, there's three distinct culinary traditions uh, that form the basis for Neapolitan cuisine. There's the cucina povera, the Manzu tradition, and the Cucina dei Conventi. Um, I'm going to start with the Cucina Povera, which consisted of bread, vegetables, legumes, eggs, cheese, and spaghetti. They were the staples of the poor. There was rarely any meat. I even remember my grandmother telling me um, they had meat 
a little bit of meat on Christmas, and that was it. They didn't have meat most of the year, which to me was, you know, I couldn't believe it when I was a kid. But in the interior, in places like Benevento, outside of Naples, uh, Avellino and Caserta, which are about between 25 and 40 miles outside of Naples itself, um, they are more of what you would call the hinterland. So they had some meat there because they had a lot of uh, forest and there were animals that they could hunt and, and eat the meat. But generally speaking, the poor had lentils over bread. That was their, their protein. Uh, if they had chickens, they would have omelets. Um, but the food of the poor was always characterized by creativity and ingenuity and nothing ever went to waste. Not one part of the animal went to waste. Um, the the Manzu tradition was entirely different. Um, in 1768, the Borbone king Ferdinand IV married Maria Carolina uh, of Austria, and she brought the French style of cooking to Naples. And uh, her chefs taught other chefs uh, the French cuisine, and they in turn incorporated this style with Neapolitan dishes. Um, these chefs were called Monzu, which was probably a Neapolitan pronunciation for Monsieur, for Monsieur. Um, and even today, the great chefs of Naples are called Monzu. Um, there were plenty of meat dishes in this cuisine. Never would they serve a simple pasta with sauce. This was, um, these were the great houses, the great palazzi with the aristocrats, and every one of them had their own Monzu uh, that cooked for them. Um, the pasta with sauce, plain pasta with sauce, that was for the poor. Um, when the Manzu did serve pasta, it was part of an elaborate construction of a dish such as a timbale. I don't know if you've ever seen that movie, Big Night, and they're making this fabulous timbale with pasta and meats and all kinds of things. And then it gets wrapped in this big, um, and was sort of, um, a pie, but very deep. Uh, this is the style of the Manzu. So it was a very elaborate construction. Not, not many people could do it outside of these, these chefs. Um, and the famous ragu napoletana, that we call ragu, R-A-G-U today, was a dish that was created from a, a French stew that was called ragout or ragout or R-A-G-O-U-T. I'm sure you've seen uh, that in writing somewhere. Um, that was a meat stew, but in Naples, it was created using tomatoes and a large piece or two of meat. And it was used in the timbales, stuffed peppers, stuffed eggplant, or egg, you know, um, it was not used as a sauce on top of pasta until later on uh, when the rich and the poor ate almost the same things. But for a, quite a period of time, they were two separate styles of eating. Um, the third and probably the one we like the most is the Cucini dei Conventi. These are your desserts. Um, this was the cuisine found in the kitchens of the monasteries and convents. Monasteries had land, they had large gardens, they grew their own food, and they had a mission to feed the poor. Um, the convents were the places where the most iconic Neapolitan pastries were created. So the sfogliatella was created by nuns in the 1700s. This, you have your, your sfogliatella riccia, and then the next day, the next photo you'll see is sfogliatella frolla. It looks entirely different, texture is entirely different, has less, the other one, the riccia, is filled with uh, a custard type cream. This has very little because, again, it was, um, more of what the poorer people would eat if they had dessert at all. Uh, so it was less rich than the richa. And they call it frola because it was mostly made up of dough with that little bit of uh, flour and so cream inside. Um, the pastiera, that famous Neapolitan pie, uh, was created by the nuns in the convent of San Gregorio Armeno in the 1600s. And then we have baba, which is probably aside from the pastiera and the sfogliatella, probably the most loved um, dessert in Naples. However, it was not invented in Naples. It became a favorite dessert when the French brought it to the city in the 1800s. It was introduced in France um, by the Polish king, 
uh, Stanislaus when he was in exile there, and then the French brought it to Naples when they were ruling the city, um, the kingdom actually. And Zeppelin, we all know Zeppelin, that was popularized in the early 19th century by Pasquale Pintauro. And Pintauro is still there to this day on the Via Toledo in Naples. I go there often to get my farola because I prefer it to the, the riccia. Um, and there's different kinds, you know, the Zeppelin is fried dough, but there are different kinds. Um, at Christmas, we had one kind that was um, one type, it was fried and then sprinkled with um, sugar. And the other was filled with anchovies. So you could have it either way. And then there's the Zeppoli di San Giuseppe, which you have on San Giuseppe Day, and that is um, filled with custard. Now they also have one with cannoli cream, but that's not the original. Um, and these desserts were believed to have originated in Arab countries. And all of them are suitable for breakfast in Naples and also as desserts. So breakfast in Naples is not bacon and eggs, it's, it's sweet, sweet dessert. Um, but the most important thing, oh, and I just want to point this out. This is just Fogliatella at a Chris, as a Christmas decoration hanging over the city. The Neapolitans do have a wonderful sense of humor, and that's their Sfogliatelle as a, as a Christmas decoration. And I think we have, and there's a pastera. pastera. Um, so I was there just before Christmas one year, and all down the street, they had their iconic foods uh, as Christmas lights, Christmas decorations. So that was a lot of fun. Um, but the most important thing in Naples, even more than all the food, is the coffee. Now, the coffee in Naples is considered to be the best in all of Italy. Um, and it's such an, an important part of a Neapolitan's day that it was felt that no one, no matter how poor, should ever be deprived of having a cup of coffee to begin their day. Um, this happens to be a, absolutely, it's like a dessert coffee. It was an iced cappuccino uh, and they decorate it like a, like a painting because it's that important. Of course, the traditional, um, the traditional coffee is espresso. And I don't usually like espresso, but I can drink it in Naples because it's not bitter at all. It's just really a delicious flavor. But it was uh, very important that everyone have access to coffee. So in a working class area of Naples, um, they started this tradition called Cafe Sospeso. And it's a suspended coffee. That's what it means. And it's a kindness to strangers that started because someone uh, would pay for their own coffee and they pay for a second cup, which they would not take. Um, the receipt for that second cup would be put in a special container. And when someone came in who was in need and they didn't have money um, to buy a cup of coffee, they could take the receipt from the container, bring it to the counter to the barista, and they would get their cup of coffee. And this is an example of one of the reasons why I just love Naples so much and love Neapolitan people so much, because they care, there's heart, there's heart there. And this is Neapolitan heart. Um, the tradition continues to this day, and it's um, throughout, now it's uh, something that's happened throughout the world. A lot of places, even the United States have started this Cafe Suspeso, and also, in, in more dire times with food. And they've even done it with Christmas toys. So it's a form of charitable giving, um, but instead of in a corporate scale, it's individual one by one. And the most famous place uh, where this cafe, cafe Suspeso is on display is this fabulously gorgeous uh, Cafe Gambrinus in the heart of Naples, uh, in the downtown area across from the Palazzo. Um, very luxurious. It was a an important literary salon in the 19th century. Uh, so you had all the famous writers and artists of their day uh, congregating here, um, having their coffee and, and their desserts and sitting around and exchanging ideas. And there's the outside and now they have tables. So it's even possible to stay out there in the in the winter because they put those heaters out there. And it's a great place to people watch because in front of the cafe, Across the uh, piazza is the opera house, 
uh, the Palazzo Real is to the side, uh, and you have all kinds of activity and people watching. Sometimes they even have uh, musical um, events that happen in the square. So it's a wonderful, wonderful place. And they have other desserts too. Well, first of all, here's this. This is to, to me even more important than the coffee. This is hot chocolate. Now I have never, I've had hot chocolate in other places in Italy too. This is more like taking about 10 bars of deep dark chocolate and melting them. That's your hot chocolate. It is to die for. And I probably would if I had too much of it. If I lived there, it would not be a good, good idea for me to, to have that every day, but it's absolutely delicious. And then here is, now I don't know if anybody saw Stanley Tucci's Searching for Italy, but this is the dessert um, that he called Delizie di Limone. And it is, this is my favorite dessert. It's that cream, the lemon cream on the outside, a yellow cake on the inside with the lemon filling. It's just out of this world. And that's served at Cafe Gambrinus also. And now we're going to what I call the iconic foods of Naples, Naples, pasta, pizza, mozzarella di bufala, and tomatoes. You can't speak about Naples without talking about these foods. <clears throat> now the pasta of the South is different from the soft pasta of Northern Italy. And Garibaldi himself is supposed to have said that the thing that unified his army of diverse mercenary soldiers was their love of the pasta from the South. It's made of hard Durham wheat, and the best pasta is made in the town of Gragnano. Um, and the most important part of making the pasta and tasting that special flavor is the drying process. Now, when you have commercial pastas, they're dried very quickly. That changes the taste entirely. Um, but in Gragnano, they had the perfect climate uh, for drying the pasta. And at one time, all the streets of this town were filled with lines with pasta drying on these lines, like clothes on a clothesline. And it was, you know, just filled with pasta drying in the sun. And they have over 2,000 years of pasta making history. And they fed Roman soldiers uh, in the year 3 BC. So it's a lot earlier than Marco Polo supposedly introduced noodles to Italy. Italy had pasta long before that. Um, and today, although the pasta is dried inside and in, in uh, small factories, it still undergoes that same slow drying pasta. And Grognano pasta is still considered to be the best amongst you know, the Neapolitans and people who like their imported pasta. And as I said before, Naples is almost fanatical in its unique details in how to eat certain things. And here's an example. In Naples, pasta that is al dente is considered overcooked. Now, I have eaten at people's homes and in restaurants, and I like al dente pasta. But this was not al dente. This was more like, oh, this wasn't cooked enough. But it was. It's called fuglieni. And this means before it becomes al dente, and it's said by the Neapolitans that cooking pasta this way retains more of the taste of the wheat. It's less starchy because the more you cook it, the more starch is released. And it doesn't feel as heavy in your stomach. So they know what they're talking about. Uh, we're just not used to it. So the other good thing is that the secret to not gaining weight while you eat pasta every day is fuglieni, because less carbs are released the less time it's cooked. So you might want to try this. Um, and of course we have pizza. And in the late 1590s, going all the way back, pizza was considered a street food only. It was sold from stands on the street. It was usually fried. It was fried dough with uh, you know some kind of filling inside. It didn't have tomatoes because they weren't really they weren't really popular yet. Um, but it was sold at food stands in front of you know another kind of store. Um, 
It was made in one location and then sold by vendors at these open stands. And later on, it was sold directly by the pizza makers in their own spaces. Um, the first pizzeria was founded in 1830 in the Centro Storico uh, area known as Porta Alba in Naples. And it's still there today. And they serve pizza and pasta and other things. Uh, I think we have a picture of it somewhere. I'll let you know when we come across it. Anita, um, I'm gonna, um, my, my slideshow's not moving forward. So I'm gonna back out and go back to your pizza okay. Um, photo. Okay. Oh, there we're moving again. So let's see here. There we go. Okay, here we go. So this was the one of the oldest pizzerias in Naples. And that's not to say it's the same uh, as the Pizza Margarita, the place that started with the Pizza Margarita. This is something else. This is before Margarita. This is the typical Neapolitan fried pizza and it was served um, in 1830 in this place that is still there to this day. You can sit inside or outside and it's, that picture was just taken a couple of years ago. So it's a very old uh, place. It's been around for a long time. And pizza today is actually in Naples, it's considered an evening food. Daytime is the time for a full meal. Um, that's changing now too, but for the most part, your pizza is usually served at night. And Many um, pizzerias don't start until the night because it's too hot during the day anyway. Your ovens are heated to 800 uh, degrees or more, so it's too hot during the day. And you'd be hard pressed to find pizzerias in the um, non-tourist areas that are open during the day. Um, and there's two proper ways to eat pizza. One is at a table where you have it with a knife and fork. And I remember when Mayor de Blasio went to um, Naples and they made fun of him here back in the States because he was eating pizza with a knife and fork. But he was doing as the Neapolitans do. And they eat pizza with a knife and a fork. When you want to eat pizza in your hand, then you have what they call pizza portfolio. And it's folded like a wallet in four. So you have your own personal pizzas, small smallish size um they fold it in half and then they fold it again so nothing drips out and even our way of eating pizza in half it, it's still messy but this folding it in four is not and i think we have a, a picture of that somewhere i'll show you later um, pizza portfolio is really unique to naples i've never seen it anywhere else um and again pizza was not a food that rich people ate until the pizza margarita was created at Pizzeria Brandy. And that was the first place that made the um, pizza margarita. Once the queen liked it, then the aristocrats naturally followed suit and it became popular with both rich and poor. And there's only three types of pizza that can be designated verace pizza napolitana, true pizza napolitana. And that's the margarita with basil, tomatoes, and cheese from somewhere in the Apennine Mountains. So cheese that came from cows in the Apennine Mountains. Um, the extra margarita was the second kind, and that's basil, tomatoes, and you must use buffalo mozzarella from the Campania region. And then there's the marinara, no cheese. It uses tomato sauce, oregano, garlic, and oil. And it was called it's the name from the marinaio, the fishermen who ate it as a snack on their way home from a day of fishing. There were people at the port that were selling the, these kind of pizza. And without the cheese dripping, it was easier for these fishermen to get off the boat, grab a snack, and then head home for their regular meal. Um, and here we have the most adorable buffalo mozzarella. Now, you know, in India, they say the cows are sacred. Well, in, in Italy, these buffalo mozzarella are sacred because they produce the most delicious cheese on earth. And every one of these places that has these buffalo farms has a restaurant attached to it and a store. 
So you can sit down there and have the buffalo mozzarella that is the freshest you'll ever get it because it's it's just um, from the cows that morning, from the buffalo cows. And these buffalo, as you can see, don't look anything like what we call buffalo. These look more like, they look more like cows or bulls. Um, but the water buffalo themselves came from India in the sixth and seventh centuries. And they were brought to Sicily and then to Campania by the Turks and the Saracens, because first it went from India uh, to that part of the world and then to uh, Italy. And there are seven provinces where mozzarella di bufala comes from. Most of them are in the Campania region, Salerno, Caserta, Benevento. And then there's some in Lazio, in Latina, Frosinone, and Foggia in Puglia. But the most famous and what they consider the best are from Campania, particularly in Salerno in the, the area called Paestum. And Paestum is also the town where uh, this three perfectly, practically perfectly preserved temples. So you could go there sightseeing and then go to lunch at one of these places. Um, and you can visit these water buffalo farms, uh, taste the, the mozzarella, and you can go right up to these water buffalo. And I've actually petted them. They seem very docile. They do have horns, but I've been standing, you know, pretty close uh, and, and pet them and they were okay. Um, they do love to roll around in the mud and they have their little muddy area. But then after they have their own private showers, they're, you know, they are, it's like a spa for them. They are treated very well because they're considered, you know, the queen, the queens of their crop. Um, the film of the most famous of these farms is Vanulo in Paestum. So if you ever get to the area, you have to go and, and see the water buffalo and eat that mozzarella in the place where it will be the freshest. Um, now, tomatoes. So here you have a gorgeous mozzarella with the tomatoes. Now the tomatoes were brought to Europe uh, from the New World. These are the beauties. They were not trusted as something to be eaten at first because originally they were used as decoration mostly because they were believed to be poisonous. And the Neapolitans were the first Europeans to eat the tomatoes. And Northern Europeans and the aristocrats in Northern Italy used to use pewter utensils to eat. The tomatoes reacted to the metal of the pewter and people got lead poisoning. So that's why they thought that the tomatoes themselves were poisonous. However, the people in Naples who were rich didn't use pewter. I don't know what they used, but they did not use pewter. So they didn't get sick and the poor ate either with their hands or with wooden utensils. So they didn't get sick from the tomatoes either. So until the 1800s, tomatoes were only eaten in Naples where rich and poor alike had been eating them for a while because they didn't get sick from them. And preserving tomatoes also began in Naples in the 19th century. Now the seeds for these the famous San Marzano tomatoes were given by the Kingdom of Peru, which again is the new world, uh, to the Kingdom of Naples as a gift. And they thrived in the rich volcanic soil around Vesuvius. So they're called pianolo. Um, also, I'm sorry, the San Martano tomatoes were one kind. And then the pianolo tomatoes, the small cherry sized tomatoes with the little pointy end on the bottom here, You've seen, they're the most delicious tomatoes of all. They, they are like eating candy. Once I tasted the tomatoes from there, I couldn't eat tomatoes from here, except in the summer when I grow them in my own garden. But this piano of tomatoes, you might as well be eating candy. And they are considered a delicacy and they're given as boxed gifts to family and friends at holiday times. And they're eaten as accompaniments to the mozzarella di bufala in salads, on bruschetta, and with spaghetti. And just, just a dish like that is a meal in itself, and the bruschetta is out of this world. 
And, you know, we have uh, not only Neapolitan food, but we have, where did it come from? There's a lot of uh, occupation of Naples, invasions, occupations, wars, immigration, and Neapolitan cuisine was influenced by many cultures throughout the centuries, the Greeks, the Arab, the French, the Spanish, but one of the biggest influences came from the Jewish people who brought certain foods and cooking traditions when they left the Middle East and when they were exiled from Spain, they went to Sicily. And from Sicily, when they were driven out of Sicily, they came to Southern Italy. And today there are no longer large Jewish populations in Naples or in Campania in general, but at one time there was and their influence remains. Uh, many dishes that we think of as classically Neapolitan had their origins in Jewish kitchens. For example, the zucchini, zucchini flowers, um, finocchio, pumpkins, zucca, lemons, eggplants, and artichokes. All of these were Jewish influence. Um, and two methods of preparing food also came from the Jewish and frying. Oh, should I mute myself? Okay, I guess not. Um, there was one dish, it was a Roman dish called garum, which is said to have been an acquired taste. They say it was really awful, uh, but it was a mixing of various leftover fish parts that were thrown in a barrel and left to marinate all together. And this was used as a sauce on many dishes um, that were actually created by the Jews and brought to Campania and Rome by the Roman soldiers who had been stationed in the Middle East. Frying, which was considered an art form in Naples, this is all, I don't know how they do it, but nothing is ever greasy and it's delicious. And this was also, this method of cooking was introduced by the Jewish community and it's out of this world. But the classic uh, combination of raisins and pine nuts is another contribution. The Jews brought this to Sicily and then to Naples. The carciofi alla Judea is considered a classic Roman Jewish dish, but it was introduced by the Jewish communities who came from Judea first to Sicily and then to Campania before it ever reached Rome. Now the eggplant were brought to Sicily by the Arabs, and then they spread their use to the Jewish community, and they in turn brought them to Naples. And early on, eggplants were under the same suspicion as tomatoes, as being poisonous and dangerous to eat. The Italian name melanzane comes from the word for apple, mela, and zane, which means insanity. So it was called the, basically the insanity apple. Um, but they eventually gained acceptance because the laws of Kashrut made foods eaten by Jews to be considered safe to eat. So people took their leads from the Jewish community. Now, lemons are another staple of Campania, especially around the area around Naples, Sorrento, and the other places. Although they're seen all over the South, the lemons are not native to Italy either. They were originally grown in India and China, and they eventually were introduced to Persia, Iraq, and Egypt around 700 AD. They were cultivated in the Mediterranean between the year 1000 and 1150 and used in many recipes by the Jewish communities. And again, these communities brought their seeds and recipes with them to Sicily and Southern Italy when they were exiled from Spain, and then they came uh, to to Sicily and Southern Italy and brought their food traditions with them. Now, every area in Campania has different types of lemons and in turn, different uses in foods. Now, we all know, or I think we know, that there are food rules in Italy. We know about certain ones, like no cappuccino after 11 a.m., no cheese on pasta dishes that contain fish, these are rules that, you know, when I'm there, I follow the rules. Um, and this, there are these special rules in Naples that apply only if you're there. Um, this dish with the pianolo tomatoes and spaghetti. This dish is not served with cheese. No cheese goes on the pianolo tomatoes with spaghetti. 
Why? Because even though it's a, a sauce and it's pasta, it's believed that the, the cheese ruins the delicate flavor of those particular tomatoes. So you don't need any anything else but the tomatoes, the oil, and the spaghetti and that little bit of basil on top. So there's food rules that work both ways, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, another food rule is you, you don't mix onions and garlic when making the ragu. In some places outside of Naples, like Benevento, they use both onions and garlic together. But in Naples, no, only onion. So when you're making the basis for your uh, sauce, it's only onion, no garlic. Um, and you mustn't use that, that famous ragu napolitana on spaghetti. That's a heavy sauce. It's a heavy meat sauce. It's cooked in Naples for between eight and 12 hours. So it's a very heavy sauce. Um, and it's too, it, the spaghetti is considered too insubstantial a pasta to handle uh, such a heavy sauce. So for spaghetti, you use a light tomato sauce, filetto di pomodoro or a marinara, but you don't use a heavy ragu sauce. That's for the other heavier pasta dishes, like what they call pacari, um, which we would probably say is a very wide um, penne pasta or uh, another kind of shells, anything that's substantial pasta. And another rule, no cold pizza. So sorry, folks, no cold pizza for breakfast. The Italians and Neapolitans believe that the cheese, cold cheese will kill your stomach. So listen to them. And no pizza, so no pizza for breakfast. And, you know, tradition is so important there. And besides what not to do regarding food, there are rules as to what you must do. There are foods that are available all year, and you can eat them whenever you want, but they absolutely must be eaten on certain holidays. So you have many saints' days, and small towns have their own saint that they, you know, worship or, um, you know, revere and have a feast day for them. And they have, each town practically has its own uh, dish to, to welcome that saint. But um, I'll just stick with Naples for now. The pastiera, which is sold on streets in these vending um, places, as well as every every cafe and pastry shop, um, must be on the table for Easter. You can have it any other time you want, but you must have it on Easter. The struffoli must be eaten at Christmas time. You have to have struffoli at Christmas. The zeppoli for San Giuseppe on his day. Uh, the zeppoli, the other kind of zeppoli at Christmas time. Um, another is the capitone, which is eel. It's a giant eel. And this should be on the table on Christmas Eve. Uh, it's becoming less popular among the younger generation, but it was always important you have the capitone on the table Christmas Eve. And only a few foods are acceptable to be eaten while walking. One of them is gelato or even granita. And the other is the pizza portfolio. There is your wallet pizza. Very neat, doesn't drip, and it's very good because the most important part of that pizza is the dough. And it's really true, no matter how much cheese or how much sauce you want to put on it, um, the flavor really comes from the dough, and it's out of this world. So that's acceptable to do while walking. Um, the only other food that's permissible in, you're not even really walking, but if you go to the beach, uh, you will see vendors at stands with fresh fish and mussels and clams being sold right from a table. So you get off the sand, you walk over to this guy, you buy your little snack of fish, and then you go back and, and sit down. Um, and for reasons of time, I haven't really talked about the role of seafood in Neapolitan cuisine. Suffice it to say that it's the most popular seafood dish is um, the spaghetti alla vongole. That is very, very um, important, iconic seafood dish uh, in Naples. And then other fish also. I mean, 
it's it's all over. You're you're by the sea, so every place serves a fish. Um, and there is one more dish that I haven't really talked about. It's hardly seen much because it's so elaborate to make and it's so time consuming. And it's called pasta genovese. Now it's found nowhere else in Italy, and its origins are unclear. And even the reason why it's called the Genovese is unclear. There's, it's an onion and meat sauce, and it's beloved by Neapolitans. And it's some of the um, the stories surrounding it are that it was either created by a Genovese chef who created it in the kitchen of an aristocratic family in Naples, or by a Genovese sailor who brought the recipe with him when he came to Naples. No one knows for sure, but what they do know is it's extremely difficult time-wise to make. It's um, say 12 dozen onions that you have to peel and chop to start with. Uh, so it's a very time-consuming, labor-intensive sauce. I've only eaten it once and not at someone's home, but in a restaurant because they probably have more manpower uh, to make it there. But eating in Naples is probably the best food. And I don't think Stanley Tucci actually did justice uh, to Naples when he was talking about the cuisine, cuisine there. Uh, it is outside of Tuscany, which has also meat dishes. The food of Naples is probably the most delicious food in Italy, aside from the fact that it's the food that basically we know best uh, because it comes from, you know, all the, all the immigrants came from there. But it is the most delicious food. You'll never go wrong eating in Naples, whether you eat at a fancy restaurant or a small, tiny trattoria. The food is absolutely wonderful all over. And um, I'd like to end my talk with a saying. Uh, you know, Robert Browning had said, open my heart and you will see engraved upon it, Italy. Well, I say, open my heart and you will see engraved upon it, Napoli. So that's um, how I will end my discussion. And I hope you enjoyed it and found it informative. And if you have any questions, I'm available. That was beautiful, Anita, thank you. Love that quote. Yeah, I'd like to open it up for questions. I haven't been able to see the chat. I don't know if Antimo has seen the chat, but if you have a question. Have no questions in the chat so okay. far. <clears throat> um, if you'd like to raise hand or we're getting some compliments, um, feel free to, to ask Anita some questions. Anita, I just love this presentation. You gave Stanley Chucci a run for his money. He's got to uh -huh. take lessons from you. Oh really. my gosh, thank you, George. You oh, are yeah. incredible. This was so well researched, and I would agree with you totally. He did not do justice to the food. No, he, he did. Didn't. He did, did not. Know. Thank you, George. Thank Absolutely you so much. Wonderful. Making thank me hungry, and I just started a diet. Yeah, right. I'm still finishing up my Easter leftovers. So uh, the diet will come next week. That was beautiful, Anita. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let's see. It looks like there's a question. What is the best time to visit Naples? Oh, the best time to visit Naples, I would say, is May and June. I also go in September. Um, it can be a little it's still hot in September, but like July and August is very hot, very hot. So May and June are just really beautiful. And what I like about May and June, as opposed to September, is um, when you're going in May and June, it's just the beginning of the season. So there's, it feels like there's an excitement in the air that it's the beginning of everything. When you go in September, the, the Neapolitans, the Italians in general, are already back from their vacations. So it's, for me, it feels like something is over rather than beginning. And if you want to go to the Amalfi Coast from Naples, uh, the flowers are already burned off because the sun was so strong all summer long. But when you go in May and June, the flowers are in bloom and everything feels fresh and it's really gorgeous. So that's a wonderful time of the year to go. 
And we have a don't question. Go don't go in November. I was there in November and don't be fooled by sunny Italy because Naples and most of Italy has a rainy season and November to January is part of that rainy season. And I was in Naples for three weeks in November one year and it rained every day, but like two days. So I, I, I felt like a drowned rat. <laughs> so forget November. We have another question regarding, I'm pretty sure that Zeppole. Uh, some, um, Patricia is saying that her grandmother used to make them at Christmas and they were deep fried with meat inside. Oh, meat. No, I hadn't seen the meat. No, just my grandmother used to make them with anchovies or plain because we didn't all like anchovies. Yeah, I guess everybody can, you know, make their own little tradition. I, I was happy that you mentioned Frosinone because that's where my family's from. So. Oh, well, okay. And I've been there and it's uh, quite, quite something. Full yeah, my, my, my daughter and my, my son-in-law's family is from there too. It's only an hour. It's an hour from Rome and an hour from Naples. So it's right in between. I would take the train to Naples, uh, to mm -hmm. Rome. What about the wines? The wines in um, Naples, you know, you have the, um, the Falangina, which is the one I like. It's mild. It's very mild. So a lot of people that are real um, wine connoisseurs don't care for it too much. But I... I I like it. It's a nice, gentle, fruity wine. It's delicious. Um, then you have the other ones that are, um, they're actually from Avellino, the Fiano di Avellino, and then the Greco di Torazzi, I think it is. Um, another one from Naples is the Lacrima Christi. Um, you know, that's another important wine from the area. But the, the main one is the Falangina. Can you spell, or somebody spell that for me? F-A-L-A-N-G-H-I-N-A. -A. And it's hard to find in this country. I have to order it in advance. And when they, if and when they get it, they'll send it to me by a case because uh, it's just not well known. Michael mm -hmm. said that the Alianico is also another grape and wine, and I attest to that. Alianico is probably one of the best of uh, the area in Campania. In fact, it's also uh, been brought to uh, Puglia, and it does extremely uh -huh. well in the Puglia as well. And then somebody's asking, are cannelloni popular? Cannelloni, um... Sorry, cannoli. Cannoli. Cannoli, cannoli. Well, cannoli is, is there, but that's a particularly Sicilian dish. Uh, it, it's, it's sold in Naples, but it's not a Neapolitan dessert. <clears throat> and what about uh, talking more about the Baba Ram pastry? Very popular. Even though it wasn't invented in Naples, it's, it's extremely popular. In cakes, in, in the small individual pieces, uh, yes, it's extremely popular. Probably, probably equally so with the um, um, the Sfogliatelle. And there's count, you know, there's little stands throughout the uh, historic district where there's just these vendors selling this, this Sfogliatelle and the Baba right on the street. So you can buy it and just stand at the counter and, and eat them. But they're outdoors. Anybody else? What too about bad a, can't, too bad we can't get those piano or tomatoes here. That would be a treat. What about other types of cheeses? Are there any aged cheeses? Uh, you know, the funny thing that I found out is I don't know why this is, but in my family, we always put the cheese on the pasta uh, from Rome. We had the uh, Pecorino Romano, yeah. and that went on our pasta. And in Naples, they use Parmesan. Oh. And I was very surprised. But again, I was told the Pecorino Romano is too strong. It competes with the sauce and the pasta, so they don't use it. And I'm wondering if the reason my grandparents used it here, how it started here, is because it was more readily available than the Parmesan and probably cheaper. Mm -hmm. So that's my thought on... Well, why? Um, 
cheeses, they're not big on the forefront, except for the mozzarella di bufala. That's like the queen of cheeses, but you have your scamorza. Mm -hmm. A hard cheeses, like I said, the parmesan, cacio cavallo, the provola. They have some dishes that are made with uh, what we call provolone, but it's provola. Uh, it's it's a small hard cheese that's very good. And that's used in certain dishes, specific dishes also. Question, do they serve espresso with a lemon slice in the- No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no the most important thing about the espresso is what they call the crema. And the crema is that foamy top that goes right over. Instead of looking at a cup of dark uh, coffee, you'll see this, it's sort of a, a foamy looking um, light beige cream. And you taste that first and then you get to the other. But no, no lemon slices, nothing around the rim is necessary. I don't know where that came from. I think that's an American thing. Yeah. I think he kept the cups clean and, and more sanitary here. Is that all the questions in the chat? Yeah. Okay. All right. Does anyone else? Oh, we have a comment, but I'm not sure if it's a question. Yeah, my, I see it here. My grandparents from Sicily always drank espresso with lemon slices. Here in the States or in Sicily? Because here I saw a lot of people doing that too, but not. Uh, it's not a really an Italian thing, especially not a Neapolitan thing. They migrated to the U.S., so they may have picked up the habit here. Because I'm, I'm trying to. I haven't been to Sicily uh, in a long time, but I don't remember seeing it there either. It's just not an Italian thing to put your lemons on the on the rim. Well, I hope it gives you a little bit more of an appreciation for Neapolitan food as not strictly a you know, uh, a poor people's food or something that was just, you know, part of the whole Italian thing, but a very, very specific cuisine. And the, the like I said, the attention to detail and the, if you want to call it fussiness, uh, is so important to, to this way of cooking and eating. It is almost like a religion to eat in Naples. It really is. And from the, the tiniest trattoria, to one of these beautiful seaside um, restaurants, you will get delicious food. One last question. Mm -hmm. Why they don't, they don't drink cappuccino afternoon? Oh, because again, everything with an Italian is about the stomach and your fegato, the liver. And drinking cappuccino with milk in the afternoon is too heavy on your stomach. And in the heat of the day, it doesn't settle, they believe it doesn't settle well. And that's not just in Naples, but that's really all over Italy. I remember one time I was in the north, I was in Liguria in a town in San Remo. And we went to a casino and you know my friend was sitting at the table and she was gambling and I was bored. So I wanted to drink coffee. It was like 11 o'clock at night. And I ordered a cappuccino because I didn't like espresso except in Naples. They actually came out of the kitchen to look at this person who was ordering cappuccino at 11 o'clock at night. And they, they, you know, I said, I'm the crazy American, you know, it's okay. But no, it's because of the stomach. It's because they just feel it's too heavy on your stomach. The same way I was in, um, I was in Sicily in July one year and they did not serve cannoli. We were sitting in a cafe and they would not serve cannoli. They said, you crazy? It's July. It's too heavy. Anything with milk in it is going to be too heavy in the heat of the Italian summer. So that's why. It's a breakfast. It's a breakfast coffee. That makes sense. Yeah. Too heavy in the heat. Well, um, thank you so much, Anita. I think maybe that was our last question. We have a, a lot of thank yous in here I'm seeing. And um, I really appreciate it. And we really appreciate you joining us and um, 
sharing such a beautiful um, way of life and a beautiful people, um, the Neapolitans. Thank you for your expertise and for all that you shared with us. Well, thank you for having me and thank you everybody for tuning in too. I am really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Have a thank you. Buona notte. Buona notte. Buona notte. Grazie.